What is up, everyone? I was able to find a really special architect background, home builder, RJ Diaz with us from Modus Builders. He's first generation. His family's from Columbia. He's born in the States. He worked in New York City for over 20 years, went to Penn State, or as we like to say, we are Penn State. Are. Penn and State. he studied architecture and he has created a boutique building business located in beautiful Sarasota, Florida. If you don't know where that is, look it up. It's got Siesta Key, number one beach in the country. It was ranked a couple times. Maybe it's still ranked a couple times. And RJ has been able to start his own business and scale it, grow it, and he's still adapting. And he's been able to carve out how to be successful outside of corporate America by literally taking a hammer to the nails in the home building space. So super happy to have RJ on and share any insights on his journey to from where he started at Penn State studying architecture to where he is now and architecture is something that's super cool my um my wife's cousin's at SCAD studying architecture and he tells me like all about it how has architecture changed in the last 20 plus years like what have you been seeing that's a little bit different from when you jumped out into the real world to what you're doing currently well, first, thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's an honor, pleasure to be here and share my story and, and, and talk to you today. Um, architecture, for sure, has changed. I get to be around it quite a bit, um, working with very, very talented designers and architects. And, you know, maybe it's obvious, but it's become very, very digital. Um, I'm not sure beyond doing sketching and, and figure drawing that they're teaching much in, in terms of hand drafting. Uh, which is what I did. This is that's how I got interested in studying architecture. Was taking a drafting class in high school and became fascinated with that this idea of uh, combining something sort of artistic with something pragmatic. Um, and I think that's what what eventually brought me into the building side of of things. And after studying in architecture and uh, my first real job, I want to say out of out of college was with the construction management company. And just loving that part of the process, working with architects, being involved in discussions around design and, and things that are beautiful, um, initially working in a lot of commercial projects, a lot of boutique retail type environments, um, and, and that becoming more and more residential in New York City interiors. And I've been, I feel like I've been fortunate in my my proclivity, I want to say my tendency is in terms of taste and aesthetics is more modern. And it, it just, maybe I manifested it, maybe it was uh, for other reasons, or just pure luck that we started the, the projects that I worked on, uh, were very modern in terms of aesthetic, right? Sort of, I don't want to say minimalistic, but there is a lot to that minimalistic in terms of detailing and not a lot of ornamental um moldings and and those types of details either exterior or interior and um but to answer your question i mean i i think the most obvious one and it'll be interesting what ai uh, how ai will affect things but for for certain uh architecture has become much more digital and uh and less analog i've always wondered especially in florida and in south florida in the area that you're in a lot of the houses are old what were these architects thinking when they built these Florida houses? Like they're terrible looking, especially some of the older ones. Like, are you able to provide any insight on that? Like how architecture has like adapted with home building, especially the houses that were built in like the seventies and eighties till now. Well, what's interesting is that Sarasota in particular, and there is uh, what, what I would call a Sarasota school of architecture modernists that were, you know, came out of the mid century movement of, um, Minim minimalizing or minimizing, I want to say, the traditional forms, but you still have that, right? You still have, and there was in the 70s and 80s sort of a backlash to that of uh, architects or, and, and a lot of it is unfortunately driven by the people who who had money coming down here and they were wanting to sort of, you know, they wanted to bring in what they considered home from the the Midwest or the Northeast and, and from other areas that weren't really meant for um, this climate. Right. So uh, there, there is that mixture and you see you, you, and, and where we are in Sarasota is kind of, I want to say the hub 
um, of of things transitioning, right? So there's that reintrodu reintroduction of this fascination with this modern school of architecture, uh, Palm Springs, and something that's I'm I'm really tuned into and really love in terms of aesthetics, um, as opposed to I want to say this false, fake sort of um, Italianate, uh, you know, Palazzo looking Renaissance architecture that, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of it's beautiful applied in the right places, but a lot of it is just so out of place. And and that's that's what we're trying to, we're trying to bridge that gap, right? So we're working with architects and working with clients and trying to educate them, I think, is 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 part of the important things we do. Um, and being involved with it from start to finish is is what's fascinating to me. So you're doing custom custom home building? That's correct. All right, got it. Because like a lot of people are seeing you have like your NVRs, your DR Hordens. They go into uh, an area like South Carolina, buy a bunch of real estate, tear it all down, and then build up you know, maybe 10 or 12 different models in a community. And I know in Jacksonville, they had Nocatee, which was huge. And they did something similar to like that style of like right. all the houses are the same. What is something when someone's looking to buy a house, especially like a new build house that they need to look out for when it comes to before they like put down five, six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars, like from an architectural standpoint that maybe someone like me would never even think of. So I, I just think that you're you're comparing from my point of view, apples and oranges in terms of how homes are built, how they're planned and what their aesthetics are, right? So the DR Hortons, you know, those are some great business models. They're doing good things for affordable housing and, and to keep pricing low. Um, but at the end of the day, those, that's a commodity, right? So you're paying for something that a lot of other people have, right? And some of the tips or some of the tricks that they have is just mirroring a floor plan to make it look different, right? Or changing like what it looks like from the curb. Um, so it looks like it's a different home, but at the end of the day, all the floor plans are exactly the same. And a lot of it's tested and it works very well, but then you have, uh, because they're production built and because the pressure is on building them as cheaply as possible to keep those prices low and accessible, uh, for a bigger audience because they are doing production in that type type of scale, you're not necessarily getting the quality that you would uh, with a custom built home or something that a boutique more boutique builder is doing where they're working with architects mm -hmm. and they're it's it's not just about how beautiful it is, but how well it's planned out, how it's situated relative to the landscape around it, you know, those types of considerations. And so it's they're just very different. And so when you have someone looking at, uh, when you have a home buyer looking into what I want to call a commodity home, but the, like I said, there's a reason why they're affordable is because they are, unfortunately, you know, you're going to use the word cookie cutter and they are cookie cutter, right? They're repeated over and over again. They know exactly um, how much material to buy of everything. And at the end of the day, they're just finding the, cheapest contractor to do each of the pieces right whether it's the concrete masonry the windows the the framing the roofing all of those things and and there are companies that make money or are able to make money because they're also at scale the problem becomes is when you have downturns in the market like we have now where um th those types of home buyers are affected by the interest rates so you know now you have production builders that are not um as productive, right? They're not, they're, they're not building to that scale anymore. And so you have smaller builders that are doing, I, I mean, I don't think I do more than five homes a year, right? So that's the scale that I'm, I'm building. At. It's not a comparison. Not, I don't think it's better or worse. It's just a different, it's just a different business model. Um, and we're talking to each client and we're, you know, we do have plans that we have built multiple times, but we're not, talking about that kind of scale and we are adapting them both to the homeowner as well as the the environment the surroundings are we on water is there different you know soil conditions that we have to change a different type of foundation um you know how do they live are they more entertainers are they do they have guests you know those types of things that affect all the decisions that 
you know, for me, make it interesting, right? So if I was building the same thing over and over again, if it was all about the money, I guess that would be fun and fascinating is how you could squeeze out every single penny. Um, and how could I build the neck, the same house again, cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Um, and, and now it's happening. Now you're having sub that kind of what we call a subcontractor base, a little bit desperate for the work because they're at, they're at a certain scale and they have to scale down. And so you see layoffs, but you also see the people that are still doing that type of work, uh, just wanting the, the pro they, they just want the work. So they're doing it almost at cost, right. To keep everybody busy. Um, so I, I don't know. I'm sorry if I don't, I'm, I'm not answering your question. I, I think it's just a roundabout way of saying how that, you know, we have, it's a different model for us. Uh, in terms of how I do business, I'm able to scale up and scale down because, you know, we, you have to, um, in, in doing what, I, what I'm doing, um, scaling up or scaling down in terms of not just the internal structure of the, of the company structure, but also the sub base that you're using. And you are having to be pretty versatile and adaptable to, you know, what the market conditions are. Right now, the market conditions are... People aren't moving from their houses or selling their houses. And if people want to buy a house, now you have to build more houses and figure out where to put those. How are you, you know, based on your knowledge and being in the space for over 20 years now, which may be weird to say, I've been in something for 20 years. It's like, oh crap, 20 years is crazy. <laughs> uh, wh wh where are you seeing real estate going in terms of being that, People are staying in their houses. They're like, well, I can't afford my house anywhere else. So I'm just going to stay put. Even if they have a million dollars worth of equity, it's like, where would you go? It's like, you could go anywhere you want and rent or travel or do whatever. But a lot of people are attached to their homes. So do you have any insights on what you feel like could happen in the next 20 years? Well, over the next 20 years, I think there's just a different buyer. I think that... Um... Uh, you're younger than I am. So I, I think you're in that place where you don't need the big home. I, I don't need it. That's not what I'm interested in, right? I don't need this palatial home. It's just more to take care of and more money to take care of it, right? To maintain it, whether I do it myself or hire people to do it. And I think there's a priority shift that is going towards. And and, and again, maybe this is becoming cliche and, 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 you know, said over and over again, but I know that my discussions with my wife are more about what's what experiences do we want to have with our kids that are two or three years away from leaving their house and starting their own their own lives, their own families. And what do what do we see beyond that? You know, do we see vacation homes or having multiple homes? I don't think that's so much the priority as it is uh, just being smart because of having gone through now a few cycles. Right. in in terms of e economic cycles. But big things like COVID happening, uh, where you never know if another COVID comes, what are you going to do, right? What are the things you're going to do? And, and you know, emergency savings, and we're looking on, you know, we're looking at what what's beyond that, which is, um, you know, making sure that we're insured, right? That, you know, so in terms of how it affects real estate, I think right now, it's the smart thing to do and be and and the way we set up our business is to be versatile in the fact that we're not just doing home building that we're also doing home remodeling and renovations because um that's where i started that's that was my that's my background that's what i know that's what i'm most comfortable with that's what i did for most of my career before i came to florida and learned the home building side of things which fascinated me because now i could do complete structures now my license that I was able that I qualified for with my experience and and was able to get here in Florida allows me to build whatever I want. I can build skyscrapers with my license if I wanted to. I'm most interested in building architecture, building custom um, environments, I want to say for what and whether the client is a, a business owner or a homeowner. That's the part that interests me and keeps me going um, every day. I'd love the idea of community building. I think that's something that's fascinating to me, um, not at, at at a large scale, but the idea of fitting, of creating communities around uh, certain environments. Um, you know, I live for a little bit uh, outside of Sarasota in in a, a new unincorporated area called Lakewood Ranch, which is part of Bradenton, right? So this was 
not not long ago, ranch land, cow pasture, orange groves that they built a community out of. And, you know, obviously they, they needed to, to build it at scale. So they brought the D.R. Hortons and they brought, um, you know, a lot of these home Lennar and all these big home builders because doing it, at, you know, with builders like me wouldn't make sense three or four or five um houses at a time right they they needed to build that scale in order to support um the cost of creating the infrastructure around these communities so you know my interest is in looking at what are called pocket neighborhoods right how do we either transit how do we how do we get into areas that are already built that are transitioning gentrifying those types of things um doing spec homes i i've done a couple and you know those types of things when you start, when you can do those at a little bit of a scale, right? Where you're building in a smart way uh, for something that makes sense around the community. This this community that we're building in, or where I was doing spec homes, was around a hospital. The hospital is only getting built bigger. Bigger hospitals need more doctors and all the support staff that go with it. They need a place to live. And obviously, you're 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 increasing the value of the real estate um, and having to build a product that's suitable for the doctors and the people that can afford it. And then, you know, but we're also talking about looking at multifamily and building multifamily projects for um, for support staff. Right. Um, so in terms of real estate uh, on the consumer side, I think right now the smart thing is to reinvest in your own home. Right. And and. I want to say almost double down on creating the equity because borrowing money again to to build or or buy a, a new construction home only makes sense for a cash buyer right now, right? And that, and I'm fortunate to be in that space of the luxury higher end market where it's not affecting um, me as much as I think the the production builder at least that, that's that's how I understand it from the industry. And it's going to change. It's a cycle like any other cycle. Anybody that's been around for a long time has been through those cycles before and, and understands it, right? So, um, and, and that's how I see it. So if I were to buy a house in Florida that was built, say, in the 80s, and I wanted to work with RJ, how would you approach taking that home to transform it into something that looks a lot nicer for this day and age? So that's a great question. And it's a great question because it's exactly the position that I'd love to be in, which is having someone come to me and say, hey, RJ, can you put the team together that would know how to get the most value out of this house, right? So this isn't about building a trophy for yourself, right? And building something that's out of character with a neighborhood or building something, what I want to say is overbuilt that you'll never see your money back because you put way too much money into it. So I, you know, I like approaching it from the standpoint of, of empathy in terms of understanding who my client is um, and asking a lot of questions about why they're doing it, right? Why are they buying this house? Is it a second home? Is it a home they want to bring their, their family? Is it something that they're going to use seasonally? Is it they're going to something they're going to use year round? And that informs a lot of the conversations and a lot, even just bringing the team together of do I do I need an architect uh, for this is a designer, uh, a designer that, I you know, and having those resources and knowing what's what are the right tools to put together? What's the right toolbox for for what a client has in mind and then put together a proposal and basically create a a, a what I would say is a turnkey proposal, almost a design build. I mean, you know, design build has this, this, this sort of a big umbrella, but the the key point of design build is designing, whether it's the house or the, the approach to what you want to eventually put together and have at the end of the day. And it's turnkey. So we're, ta we're, we're taking you all the way through that process, managing that process, managing the communication with everybody involved, um, I, I like focusing on transparency between costs and how long it's going to take. Um, and, you know, I always say to anybody that I talk to that's interested in in working with me is please do talk to other people. Please do get references. And at the end of the day, please do not chase the price because you may chase the price, but not really like the person you're dealing with. And that almost always ends in disaster. 
Um, there's no construction project that I know I've ever heard of that's gone perfectly. So you have to be willing to work with someone that you feel like you can communicate with that um, is you can have very, very candid discussions about something that you don't like or the things that you do like and the things that are important to you and be able to share those things and ha and feel like you're being it, it's you're you're being treated with equal respect both sides right and that's the expectation that i have clients have fired me i've had i've had experiences where clients have said you know what this isn't working out and it's usually um sort of mutual i've had to let go of clients who i felt like we were just weren't on the same page it started off great um maybe circumstances changed in their life so you have to be prepared to have those conversations and have agreements that say, look, we're going to, you know, we have to agree that we love each other now. The honeymoon stage is real, right? We can be excited about the project. I can say all the right things. And there may be circumstances that change on one side or the other that that forces us to reconsider it. Fortunately, that hasn't really happened too often. And I enjoy a lot of great relationships after projects are turned over with clients. And that's what I want. That's, you know, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm not here to, you know, have a transaction, whether it's uh, a home renovation or a new, new house that's being built and walk away and feel like um, it was a transaction and, and we parted ways, right. The, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate to have to still be friends with a lot of the clients that I have and, Look, at the end of the day, it's also a referral source, right? I've, I'm not big on marketing and putting myself out there on on billboards and advertising and doing you know, those types of things. Um, I'm, I, I think by, I, I think it's secondary that I'm on Facebook only because I'm on Instagram. I like the Instagram platform. I should be on TikTok. I'm told that I should be doing TikTok and, you know, all these other things. But um, I, I'm limited in terms of my own bandwidth. And again, this is not, I'm, I'm not looking to scale a company. I've, I've gone through those periods of time where I've had opportunities to scale the company. I've tried to scale it, but then I get disconnected from my clients and my projects. And that's not what, what I'm so interested in. Right. So I, I like the approach. I like the hands-on approach. Um, if, if someone's looking for more of a corporate structure uh, in terms of um, a construction company, we're you're just not going to find it with us. I have a nice office that's downtown, right? I'm I'm not working out of my basement or out of well, Florida doesn't really have basements, but um, that's that's the northeast of me that's still thinking about basements. But yeah, or out of my garage. But um, you know, we we do have an office presence, right? But we're not trying to scale and we're not trying to uh, compete and get to that point where we're doing production building. And so and that so that part is important to me too. Um, and I and I think being flexible to uh, add manpower is needed, right? If I need extra help for project management, if I need, I'm still attached to these projects, and I'm still managing them to the point where clients know that if they need, they, if they have a question, they can call me, and and I'm pretty good about giving them an answer without having to call a project manager or go through layers of bureaucracy to try to get that answer for them. I hate it when you call a company and they say they're going to do something and then they just never get back to you. Right. It's like, Hey, why can't you just say, Hey, I don't know the answer. Can I follow up with you next Tuesday with an answer, regardless if I have an answer or not, just like building that trust of like calling someone and say, Hey, I've talked to this person. I've talked to this person. I still don't have an answer, but I promise I was going to call you with an update. I'm working on it. Let me follow up with you again this time. Because, I mean, we can't find all the answers. Uh, every person needs to know their limitations. And sometimes when you work at a big company, you have to go through the rigmarole of going through who to find on how to rectify something. Unlike your situation, if I hired you to help me build a house, if I have a problem, I call you. I know you're going to handle it. And that's it. That's that's the and end if of I it. can't, I'm going to tell you, right? I'm going to tell. I'm going to be honest with you, and that's the that's the thing. Maybe to a fault is that, and and I'm going to say I'm ninety nine thousand times or whatever. I, like it's a, a high percentage that I'm going to be able to take care of it. And if I can, I'm going to say, look, I either need your help to handle it, or I can't handle it for some reason. I need to 
do something. There, there's something that's beyond me, and it typically doesn't happen. But to your point, I think one of the reasons I built my business as quickly as I did and was able to establish myself was simply that I, I started on Angie's list, right? That's how I started building my business and doing Home Advisor before they were two, when they were two separate companies. I was on Home Advisor, and they, Angie's list has since bought them out. Um, and they keep calling me, but it's it's not a resource that I need anymore. But when I needed to build a business, because no one knew me, I, I started working for a local home builder here in Sarasota. And that's a big reason why I learned the business. And I'm very, very appreciative of it, pre appreciative of that, you know, uh, experience. Uh, but when I went off on my own and and when the uh, when my boss at the time learned that I was getting my own license was like, OK, well, I guess you're going to do your own thing. And. I was uh, kind of forced. Out. I was forced out, but it was it was a good kick, right? You sometimes you need to like you know the bird needs to be kicked out of the nest to learn how to fly, right? So um, I I had to figure out how to survive, right? I had a family, a young family, a very young family at the time, six seven years ago. I mean, I'm I'm thinking you know there were in second and third grade my kids, right? So my wife's looking at me is like, Are you sure this is a good time to be starting a business? And um, yeah, it was crazy. It was pre-COVID, uh, just before COVID, I want to say. And um, and that's why we were talking before about, um, you know, any, anything related to, you know, when's, when's a good time to start a business? There's really not a good time to start a business, but you do have to believe in it enough. And back to my point about uh, this idea of just responding and committing to what you're going to say. You, keep, you're, you make a promise and you keep it. And one of the reasons why I built my business as quickly as I did uh, to the level that I wanted it to be was simply because I showed up when I said I was going to show up. I showed up on time. And if I promised a proposal on a certain date, that proposal was in their hands on that date, right? Or before. And there may have been one or two times where something happened, well, something family related or, or something came up where I couldn't deliver on time. And I did exactly what, what you just said, which is, hey, I'm going to be, I'm, I need a couple more days. I'm sorry. I'm not going to be able to give it to you as promised. Just give me, you know, but just please give me a couple more days. And, and, you know, most people at, at anybody I've talked to in that situation has been gracious enough to say, thanks RJ. Thanks for giving me the heads up. Um, as long as I know. And those are projects that now that I think of it, the, the, the two times that it's happened, it's ended up in projects that I've actually gone ahead and done right so and and that's the feedback and you you do have to operate in in that world of of getting feedback and asking for feedback and whether it's negative or positive and and um and adjust and adapt right because it's not just about the communication and the transparency and keeping the promises you you know you have there is a certain amount of, of of things you don't realize right you don't know what you don't know self-awareness is super super hard um, and like I am doing now, I'm taking over the conversation and I'm just talking because I'm all of these things come to mind from the the little bit that you're saying. So I apologize for that. Um, so I'll let you talk I'm, and I'm sorry. <laughs> oh no, no apologies. Uh, yeah. we're just here. Everyone's here to listen and hear your story yeah. and how you yeah. took a, a passion and turned it into a profitable organization. At, at what point did you know, you're like, I got to get out and do my own thing. It's a good question. I wasn't, I'm not sure. I, I know that after being in New York City for the amount of time I, I was there, um, and it was after three years of, of, of uh, you know, three years out of college and getting a really good response from the people that I worked with. And it was mostly clients because it was, I've always worked in small boutique type environments. I've never really worked in that corporate world and in fact there was there was one point in my career where I thought I needed to I thought I had to check that box and um the the owner of the company that I worked for and again it was I think three of us in the company when I told the owner look this isn't about this is a lateral move to financially this is just about I, I think I want to explore something I, I want to explore working in a bigger you know organization and he understood um, but then a week later, I guess, because he understood my value and, and maybe I underestimated my, my value, there was just so much money and so much benefits put on the table in front of me that I realized, you know what, 
there's a reason why I'm I'm getting offered the, that kind of money. Um, and it was tempting to still go because I thought it might maybe it was a trap. Uh, but it ended up being the best thing that could have happened. And, I, and and that was after I had had my own company in New York City. 9-11 um, happened, right? So insurance rates just skyrocketed. And there were, there, there were circumstances that I just couldn't keep operating my business at the scale that I wanted to in New York City. Uh, so here we are round two kind of thing. Um, I knew that I've... I've I just feel like it's not that I know better. It's just I have a certain way that I like to go about my business and handle clients and how information is processed and and how projects are built and and um, you know with you know being fortunate having mentors and and people along the way who showed me what to look for in terms of what's good construction and what's good design and what's good um, business practice, right? wanting to apply it and say, let, let me do this for myself and have that freedom. And again, this, this leads back to what we talked about with experiences, right? So being my, being my own boss basically, and having my own company allows me the freedom to not keep a, a track of PTO, right? I don't need to keep track of how many days can I take off that are paid and, and those types of things. So risk reward, I guess, is, is the best, you know, overall way to put it. Um, but for sure, um, it, it's something that I've always been interested. I, I think that's just my, that's where I work best. I feel like when every, when everything is just on my shoulders and it's on me, because I know that if it's just on me, I know that I'll be able to take care of it. So it sounds like you were, you had special skills and you realize you had these special skills. And at the same time, though, it seems like you had an opportunity to make fast money, yet you chose to take a different path so that you could carve out your own legacy in terms of how you want to build architecture, how you want to run a business and how you want to transform people's homes, which typically a home is a happy place for a lot of people where they spend time with family vacations or holidays or just a great place to raise a family. Even though you didn't take the fast route, how did taking the slow, methodical, doing the right thing route separate yourself from some other people that maybe had success faster than you? Well, I don't think anybody is going to doubt that there is a factor of luck, right? But now you get into a position of having success and if you don't know how you had that success by taking the slow route, I'm gonna, and I'm going to say I did take the definitely the slow route, is understanding what are the things that worked, right? And so if it was only about luck, that's one thing. But if it's about luck, but uh, because you you found the right opportunities, you had enough discussions, and you were picking and choosing your opportunities, um, I I just think that the the taking that slow route gives you that ability to be mindful about the things that were successful rather than just saying, oh, I was just lucky. I was there at the right time at the right place. Well, you know, did you go to the meeting prepared the way you should have? Did you present the proposal the way you should have? Did you have the right conversations? Um, did you do the right types of follow-ups, right? So this is from, you know, by doing it, uh, you call it slow, but I, I, I'm going to say it was more a mindful approach of, of saying, you know, trying to get that awareness of the things that worked and the things that didn't, right? Um, the, the spray and pray approach, right? The, the uh, throw as many darts out there and hopefully one of them lands on the right, on the target. Um, it's, it's just not, it, it, it's just not my way. And, um, and maybe it works for other people. It just didn't work for me. Well, you're doing it all. What's trying the to. next step in terms of, building out what you're able to do. I know you said you're doing custom homes and then doing renovations. Is there anything you're able to share that is a bit innovative in the architecture space that you haven't been able to do that you've kind of been thinking about doing? So, I mean, again, I'm super interested in community building, how I bridge the, the gap of wanting to build at scale with not building a scale business, right? That's that's the part that's interesting to me. 
um, you know, from clients that I've had who have built, built businesses at a bigger scale, what I find pretty consistent is they always say to hire people that are smarter than you, right? And that's a really, really scary thing, right? So, you know, if you are not the smartest person in the room, um, I think a lot of people have a hard time not being the smartest person in the room because that's intimidating, right? And that can shake your confidence, especially if you are a uh, an entrepreneur, if you're a business owner. Um, and I think so that that's, that is the next step for me is to start looking for the people that are smarter than me. And that's, that's just, and it can be younger and older. It doesn't matter. Um, I'm fortunately, I'm not too, I'm not that young, but I'm not so old that I'm getting ready to retire that I'm not able to find people that have had, that have had that, those experiences that I could bring into the equation, whether it's an employee or even a partner to say, Hey, this is, this is the way we can grow this business in a smart way. And you still get out of it the things that you can, you can still contribute. Um, and, but we can, we can affect, <laughs> I guess in a way we affect more lives. I take very, very seriously something that you just said, which is um, home building and building a home. It's that's someone's home, right? That's like the, that's the stage of their life. That's literally like the, the, the stage that they're, you know, so, and and that's where you create memories, right? Um, and so I, I, I take that very seriously. And if I'm able to scale the business in a smart way, still take out of it the things that I want to, uh, it's super interesting to me. And, and having conversations with, with people uh, where whether it's a limited joint venture or a longer term business partnership, um, you know, that's that's something that's, that I would value very much. And one of the takeaways that I, uh, from a, a, a short uh, course that I did with Seth Godin, and I'm not sure if you, uh, if you know, or if your listeners know who Seth Godin is, and if they don't, they really, he's probably, he's one of the few people that I read every day. He's um, very, very uh, productive in terms of what he's written, a lot around the marketing space, but mostly just around just being better at what you do, empathy uh, and everything. He put together a course called the Alt MBA, Alt MBA which uh, I took early on before I started Modus Builders. And it informed a lot of how I approached the business. Um, but one of the key things that I took away from it was this idea of uh, giving feedback, but also being open to working with other people. And I was, be and before I took that course, I have to be honest, I, I love being an entrepreneur and my own having my own business because I did not want to run my decisions by anybody. Right. I wanted to make the business decisions uh, with and, and have and, and be able to do it without a committee. But there's a way to approach it. And that's one of the things that I took away from that from doing that course was uh, this idea of teamwork, of, of, of finding people finding other people and and he he calls it cohorts right so these idea of this idea of finding allies and the people that are going to support you um even if it's in in your own business i've been fortunate to find that here in this area in sarasota but um developing relationships with with people to help you take that next step and to not be afraid to get to that higher level uh, figure out what a joint venture even means and what what that could entail and how you can be involved and still have it um, still be authentic to what your mission and vision is. In terms of uh, you know architecture design and and construction, you know I, I I'm I'm not sure that I can I feel like that I could add anything other than um, empathy. Empathy is going to be the mo I feel like is the most important thing that you could bring to the table as a builder, as an architect, as a designer, as any any type of service provider when you're building someone's home. Because if I put into someone's home what I think is um, the the best floor plan or how I would want to live, that's I don't think you're serving your client well by doing that. So uh, empathy, if there's anything that I could, I could say in general, is something that I try to talk to my kids about all the time. Um, which is, you know, be empathetic, put yourself in the other person's shoes and try to understand um, good or bad where they're coming from. 
and how you could be of service to um, someone that is, you know, needs a problem solved, you'll never run out of work. You'll just never run out of work. And that's, that's the way I see it. You just got to do what you do. And sometimes when you start a business, you got to do it all. Right. Yet when you get to right. a certain point, you got to figure out like, Hey, I'm done with this tax stuff. I'm just hiring an accountant and a bookkeeper. All right. There's this other task I don't like. I'm going to pass the ball and let them do it. But I've been doing it for so many years. So I have a good enough understanding. So if someone's doing something that they're not supposed to do, I could still know what questions to ask to make sure that there's checks and balances there to make sure that the ball is snowballing in a positive and not a negative direction. So That's so exactly happy to have right. RJ on, CEO, Modus Builders, doing it all. He's not making happy meals. He's making custom homes, no McDonald's, Chipotle, you know, everyone's getting the same thing. So happy to have him on. Thanks right. for everyone listening. We'll see everyone next time. Bye everyone.